Victor Yalom, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to see you. It's great to be here. And uh, I look forward to seeing where this conversation goes. It's <laughs> kind of like, like a therapy session. You may have some ideas, yep. but uh, you don't really know where it's going to go. So I, I uh, hope to have a spontaneous give and take. Well, well, it, it's Richard here, uh, Victor, and uh, and actually, that's that's an interesting part of of what uh, has proved to be uh, Matthew and and my uh, uh, good pairing, as uh, John uh, John Arden, our good friend, says uh, says it's great. You riff with Richard, and then Matthew just brings you back to reality for goodness' sake. <laughs> but reel you in, yes. <laughs> yeah, but but it was. I mean, what's interesting is is we both. Uh, uh, both uh, Matthew and I as a, as a pair and you as a fabulous individual. <laughs> but we both work with, with trying to, to educate therapists and to, to provide, uh, provide knowledge bases and information bases. Um, and uh, across this wide spectrum of, uh, of information to uh, practice, and this was a, a big discussion going on in, with some other people I was talking about, what are we doing in research? What are we doing then in taking that research to clinical practice? Mm. And uh, also, what is it that we're researching? Have we, are we beginning to regain or are we still, uh, are we losing more sight of, of the thing that we're treating, which is the client? So I'm wondering, just as a start off in, in your experience with, uh, you know, psychotherapy.net, which is, you know, a couple of decades of, of, of doing this process of trying to give give therapists a framework what your if there's things you've been finding if there's something in your mind now about what what is it that we're 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 needing to know or what is useful to know what is what is the direction that we might need to be taking or are taking at the moment there's a there's a bunch there's a bunch of things in there <laughs> so fundamentally talk about whatever you feel like but you can see what i'm you can see sort of what i'm getting at i think yeah uh, that, that... <laughs> Where's the pragmatic direction? That's what he's asking. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That, that, that's, that's a big question. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is it's really hard to make predictions when you're in the middle of something or to, to get the 30,000 uh, mm -hmm. foot view. I mean, I remember mm. when, uh, and this is a slight tangent, but I'm sure we'll we'll have a few of these in our conversation. When I was, you know, just going to starting grad school, that was mid '80s, and went to some workshop, and and the president of our school, uh, Nick Cummings, who was quite, he was a somewhat known figure. He started the California School of Professional Psychology, mm. which was in the states and perhaps worldwide the first freestanding professional school out of the university system to teach clinicians. And he was quite a maverick and, uh, and uh, visionary in some ways, but he would make very bold statement. He said, he said back then private practice is dead. You know, it's not, it's, you know, managed care was just starting and, you know, private practice was dead. And, and uh, it turns out he was a little premature. And, and uh, so, whatever people are saying now about AI and, you know, therapy is going to be bots. Or I'm skeptical of most statements about the field. There's, it's really, there are some certainly trends, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's certainly a emphasis on teaching so-called evidence-based therapies. And I say so-called for a reason we can get into later. Uh, and there's certainly then an, an adoption in agencies and in entire countries of, certain types of evidence-based therapies, uh, but those come seem to come in, uh, you know, uh, waves or in a swinging pendulum where we, where we, uh, think we think we may have a solution or we think this makes more sense. And yet there's so much, so much unknown, so much mm -hmm. uh, uh, of a human factor uh, in therapy that <laughs> I'm skeptical yep. at times of whether we're making, you know, if, if we're making progress, if we're making changes, or we're just calling things by by new names, which certainly happens a lot. Absolutely, and I think there's there's good reason for such ambiguity about you know where we're going, what's been effective, 
there's we, we've been exploring a lot. I don't don't know if you're familiar with Ian McGilchrist and his concept of the left brain, right brain, um, not the pop psychology conception of left brain, right brain, but the different ways of being um, as a left brain or, or right brain perception of the world. Anyway, we seem to be in a society which is increasingly left brained biased. And that is a, that's a, a way of being in the world where algorithms rule, you know, we're able to pin everything down to a seek a linear sequence of events um, to solve problems and uh, like mental problems. And this is a, this is a, a way of being in the world, which is good in a, if the world really was mechanistic was a machine, but the world and ourselves were not machines. Um, and so I think we're going down a path um, which is not going to bear very good fruit um, in terms of addressing the whole person and the whole person in context. And so I, I think we need a bit of a, a revolution to go back to what McGilchrist would call, you know, more of a right-brained bias to be able to perceive and understand the whole of the person in context. And, and this is where, you know, we, and especially Richard has been talking about, you know, client responsive therapy. Mm -hmm. Richard, did you want to sort of riff on that a little? No, no, that's or... great. I'd, I'd love to hear Yalom's, uh, mm. Victor's uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, first is just let his, I suppose, just add into there, because I think that's, that's got that, that broad aspect of what I would call uh, add to it saying, that we externally evaluate ourselves. And this mm. is, you know, what I call the winner loser world, um, where there's right and wrong and good and bad, it becomes very, um, very uh, uh, bi, uh, bifocal in the way it, in the way it approaches things. And we do that in that in therapy. So we look for what works on the outside, and then use that to try and and understand what's working on the inside and that loses that individual that individual sort of process so it becomes a frustration to teach someone a technique and then to have to turn around and say but it you know it's going to work differently on each individual so, so here's the thing it has the appearance of being very pragmatic but it doesn't deliver the goods in terms of addressing the human condition that's yeah. that's that that's where we're at we're, we're we're chasing something that looks very pragmatic you know this is very you know algorithmic linear you know we're going to solve these problems in this left brain perception of the world um but it's it, it may have the appearance of, of pragmatism but it doesn't deliver the goods yeah well, one thing that comes to my mind you know uh that has meaning for me in this uh, my a mentor of mine may not be known in Australia uh, was a psychologist James Bugenthal, uh, who was actually coined the term existential humanistic psychotherapy. And it turns out I, I uh, studied with him after I finished my formal training and ended up. Uh, he was quite a brilliant man. He and ended up uh, filming him, making a video of him because I thought his work should be captured. Uh, he would do a lot of demonstrations as part of his teaching and was just just a master. Um, and the first video I made uh, was just to capture his work and that ended up starting uh, psychotherapy.net, which is what I've largely occupied myself in for the last 27 years now, in addition to clinical practice. Uh, and he, the terminology he would he used was, talked about subjectivity and objectivity, and, and we live in a world which uh, prizes objectivity. I think that's another way of the kind of the scientific or scientific outlook and uh, neglects or, you know, uh, underemphasizes the internal subjective world. And so the, and he felt that for, you know, what he called life-changing psychotherapy, that takes place largely in the inner subjective world uh, of, of the client. And uh, he had various tools and techniques and kind of philosophy 
uh, to how to help the therapist help the client gain more access to their inner inner world, their not just their feelings, but their thoughts and their fantasies and their their memories and their felt sense. So that that it's a discovery, so that a client can learn new things about themselves, and often, uh, and so there, there's something real happening. And I think that's one of the hallmarks of good, good therapy is is something happening. You know, there used to be an old old commercial for audio tapes. If any of you remember that, like a Memorex with you know, is is this live or is it on tape? And you know, he would use that as a kind of moniker. Right. You know, is, is is what's happening here in the room? Is the story you're telling me is that live, or you know, or are you just telling me a tape of a story that you've repeated several times? Um, and this yeah. discovery, the word discovery is important there, and yeah. I'm not convinced. We mentioned earlier about AI, and you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that an, an algorithm can can do that sort of discovery like a human can. You know. Yeah, no, I'm convinced it, it can't. <laughs> it, it can do amazing things, but I, I don't think it can do that. Uh, so, in terms of you know your the language you use, you know that uh, there's an emphasis on the, the left brain. I think you know, and that's that science, that's technology that creates fantastic things mm. for the world. Uh, uh, but there's an underemphasis on, you know, valuing, exploring, understanding each individual's unique subjective experience. And just to take it further, I mean, you take like the problems with, uh, you know, Facebook or uh, Instagram is, you know, one of the documented problems is you have, a, you know, it seems to be particularly uh, disruptive or, you know, for you know, females, 12 year old girls, that their identity is largely formed on, you know, a big part of certain uh, identities are formed on how much they post and how many people like them. So again, it's kind of an external emphasis on, you know, how many followers you have and what, which friends like your photo that you post versus the emphasis on, you know, what's your experience of yourself? What do you believe? What do you care about? So those yeah, are yeah. some off the cuff reactions no no it's really it's really good i mean just just following down there that facebook description i mean that interesting aspect of uh, uh, of this externalized world where we're looking for internal um assurance and satisfaction and validation by these external measures which is um unfortunate it, well it well, it's a if the goalposts, if if you give somebody else the goalposts, uh, then it's most likely that they're going to change in a in a way that doesn't suit your framework. And uh, and I keep I've got a client at the moment that fundamentally the the whole process is she keeps saying what do you think and and what do you think I should do and I and I keep saying to her I'm not going to tell you what I think I I should do. You need to do something, and then when you see what happens, we'll discuss what happens and what that means for you. But she's actually just an expression of a culture that constantly says, you need to pass the exams I set, you need to have the job qualifications that I want, uh, you know, the external world wants, you need to satisfy this constant, um, this constant barrage of external demands and needs. And uh, right. a, a lot of people do just give in to it and mm. end up in the therapy room saying, I'm not, I'm, hap I'm not happy, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, uh, thinking that it's a problem with themselves, but it's this lack of coherence between themselves and the outside world. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I talked about Jim Bugenthal, another, you know, big influence for me, obviously, is my father, Irv Yalom, and one of the great ideas, not, not a unique idea, but the, that he's written about in his, mainly in his stories is using the, the interpersonal field, the interpersonal relationship that, that's in the therapy room uh, as, uh, as an interpersonal microcosm for the client. If, they, if you pay attention to what happens between the two of you, you can learn something. More importantly, they can learn something about their relational world, their world of, of people. And that goes back to Freud and transference, but I don't, don't think the model of uh, the blank slate or the 
expert interpretation of kind of psych, classical psychoanalytic therapy it certainly doesn't fit for me. Uh, so what, <laughs> if I'm at liberty to say, which I guess I'm take, taking the liberty, you know, what another response to, to that client is, I notice how much you want to put me as the expert. And, you know, how does that feel to you to do that? And uh, then you can follow it up further with, you know, is that, is that something you typically do with others? And then if you want to kind of engage, be self-revealing and be part of that conversation, you know, is, you know, you could express how that makes you feel, uh, which could be a variety of things, which is, I feel like, you know, I really wish I could give you the right answer and I'm kind of, uh, but it makes me feel a little uncomfortable that you think I have the answers and, and then you can ask them what their reaction is to you. Uh, That's one of the the elements that faced uh, particularly me in my work, but uh, uh, equally Ernest Rossi, who uh, was my mentor, who did so much work. Oh. With. Yeah, so we wrote a book together, and so we were pretty close. And uh, he began to bring in this this questioning, this curiosity. And uh, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to bring curiosity. That I was supposed to be an expert. So I didn't know. Uh, so it was very good. It was much easier. But in that, uh, that same uh, really beautiful expression you did there, you know, how does that, uh, I can see you're placing me as the expert. And I'm just wondering, you know, how you feel about that. Whereas we've just got that curiosity, adding a curiosity was like, wow, you should be making me the expert here. Well, that's really interesting. How does that make it? Does that make you feel? I don't. How does that make? I wonder. This, the uh, really relinquishing even the wise questioner uh, as to being the uh, the unwise, and and it reminded me uh, of mothers who um, are always saying to the little child, "Oh, how do you tie your shoelaces? I don't know how to tie my shoelaces. <gasps> Look, isn't that?" Wonderful. And of course, what, what is the unfortunate side effect is that a lot of kids think for a long time that their mothers are stupid because they don't know anything. Uh, whereas, of course, that's not what the process is. And everybody comes around and they learn eventually. So there's, there's a balancing act that a therapist uses of, of sensitive observance, of, of curiosity, of not knowing, but having an opinion and keeping the client in a state that's comfortable for them. So that, that was just mm. my reflection on that, 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 that very nice description that you put forward. Yeah, I, I do wonder, because we're in a very unique situation now with um, mass social media, if the client isn't necessarily looking to you as the expert, but as the algorithm that I need to work out and satisfy, because for a good deal of the time, these young people are, are dealing with a completely artificial world of algorithms that they do have to work out and satisfy to get the right ticks, you know, to get the, to get the, um, the social the approval. And, things, yeah. um, and which is very, very different to a, a dyad in a, you know, a therapy room where you, you're faced with a real person. So I, I think this is a, this is an incredibly um, challenging situation you know, because I mean, uh, the, 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 the relationship, you know, in the therapy room, it is going to be profoundly healing. Um, but I think that, um, well, let's uh, hope it's profoundly well, healing. Well, that's well, the yes. intention. Yes. That's the intention. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Com compared to dealing with these incredibly artificial, um, social situations that the people are uh, immersed in pretty much all the time. But uh, I was just spending some time with a good friend of mine and his, his uh, you know, children, his son in his, in his 20s, you know, trying to find a job, spending, spending uh, living back living at home and spending most of the day playing computer games. Yeah. And, uh, you know, A, the computer games are, you know, shoot me up this or that. But uh, what really started, I asked him, does, does your... Um, son, does he have a physical life? Is he out walking? Is he out in the world? Does he have, uh, you know, some, you know, does he do sports? Does he have some physical embodiment to his life? And he, and he was like, no, I don't think he does, you know? 
Uh, and it's like almost he, he hadn't really thought about it before. And, uh, you know, does he have friends that he's actually being with and, you know, seeing people in person? Now, COVID has obviously complicated that, but no, he chats with some friends online, um, you know, and I, I've heard, I have another friend who had a somewhat similar situation uh, with his son. Um, that's concerning to me. I mean, that you can live, you know, I mean, I try, you know, I, I think we all struggle with how, how much screen time do we have, especially since COVID. Uh, but I know it's important for me and my, my own mental health is to be out in the world and, you know, whether it's, you know, I'm currently engaged in some physical activities, doing metal sculpture and, uh, and table tennis and, you know, hiking and being outside. And that's just, that's a critical balance to me. I let my, my wife's a, a remedial massage therapist. She also does uh, lifestyle medicine and she's a nurse. So she's, she's pretty good. We work together. We, we, we help you from top to toe. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> head to toe. But um, she, uh, it was some years ago, we were talking about this and she went and did a little bit of research and came back and said, well, we are actually 60 to 70%, depending on the way you define things. Our biology does nothing but move us. Mm. That's all it does, and of course, you could even argue for a higher percentage, but when you think that the largest percentage of our, our body and our structure and our physical structures are about movement, to appreciate that movement is integrally involved in mental health and mental processes is, um, is, is not, not a hard step to take. And of course, we know BDNF, the, uh, uh, the, the brain juice, you know, which is great for, for plasticity and, and very various uh, uh, beneficial aspects of things in the in the brains and the neuronal system is triggered and stimulated by exercise. So when someone's depressed, asking them to take a 20 minute walk uh, twice a day is a beautifully uh, neurobiologically therapeutic uh, thing to ask them to do. And, you know, and, I, and I'm just wondering, in the, you know, in all these years with the psychotherapy.net, which has got, you know, so many fantastic uh, uh, teachers and courses and things that have come through, just this framework of um, body to brain, uh, the, the, the development, the movement towards body, what sort of shifts do you think you, uh, uh, you can uh, reflect on uh, at the moment? I don't know. I mean, if there's some, there's certainly some, a lot of writing and speculation and teaching about, you know, brain-based therapy, you mentioned John Arden, the name, the name of his book, and, you know, Dan Siegel and Lou Casolino, who I heard on your uh, a podcast, in fact, I just uh, spoke, that kind of inspired me to get in touch, I just had a conversation with him oh, days great. ago, yeah. um, so I'm, you know, so there's that whole kind of, you know, I, I know, that, I know that's kind of the origins of your podcast is, uh, you know, the in interest in, the uh, you know the the overlap or interaction between brain and and psychotherapy. I'm I, I remain a skeptic on how uh, how much of all that uh, research and findings and talking and theories how that impacts uh, psychotherapy. What does it tell you to? Does it impact? Does it give you any direction for for what you say? With a client, but certainly uh, it's obviously a trend in our field, and uh, we're, you know, we may know one percent about the brain, but we know more than we did ten or twenty or thirty years yeah. ago. So, yeah, well, that, we're that's... we're certainly cautious too. We, we you know we're thoughtful yeah. about it. You know, where it's useful, it's useful. Where uh, I mean, I get a hundred and fifty things a day and you know one or two of them may be useful mm. uh, others are just uh, little tiny pinpricks in in a very event but eventually things can come together but that's one of the, the neuro babble uh, as uh, mm. scott miller talked about and right. and I, he would sort of come to me and say oh you know you do all that neuro babble and we we eventually he realized no i don't um but i don't know what not to what is the i i we know a lot more about the difference between the neuro babble and the neuroscience that's fundamentally, um, uh, that's functionally helpful for us in how we approach our clients. But well, I have no doubt, really I'm sure that there's, there's yeah. lots of great neuroscience that's, that's yeah. but it's, and interesting. How you apply that to therapy, I, I don't know. Is the um, trick, yeah. Well, yeah. We're, we're found moving away from just looking at the brain 
um, to the entire body. I mean, we were talking about Lou, Lou Coslino. We were scolded once for because we we used to call ourselves the neuropsychotherapist, and uh, and Lou said, "You know, there is no neuropsychotherapy," and mm. uh, he was very strong on that point. And, we, we, and he was and right. So, and, and yeah, and so we we shifted from that focus of what's in the cranium to the entire body, not just the nervous system. Um, and so when we when we talk about the science of psychotherapy, we're not just just talking about the brain. We're talking about the entire body in context, mm, which right. I think has been very um, very helpful um, in therapy, where therapists uh, you know become a lot more broad in their their outlook when they're addressing issues with a client and we were just talking about you know getting out and moving around moving your body getting getting away from screens and you know all of these different aspects of diet sleep um you know um there's there's so much to you your gut you know there's so many things that the therapist can address that goes right. beyond talk therapy yeah right so one one the second part of the question you know or this that I wanted to address, you know, is there a trend in terms of body using the body in psychotherapy? And I, I don't, you know, uh, uh, I don't think so. So your, uh, um, uh, Richard's, uh, your, your teacher, Ernest Rossi, obviously was, you know, bodily oriented. Um, but, you know, and, and Bessel van der Kolk wrote this book, the body keeps the score, which has been on the New York Times bestseller list for like two two years yeah, now. I yeah, it's I was just thinking. I was thinking of his name as we were talking. There's about. obviously an interest in it, and it's uh, you know it's it's a, a thoughtful book, brings together a lot of research and thoughts. But in terms of somatically oriented therapies, uh, um, whether those are mainstream, whether those are taught more, whether there are more therapists who know how to integrate the bodies and body awareness into therapy, I, I don't think there's a trend in that direction I would like there to be. Uh, and I think Zoom therapy for all its miracles, uh, uh, I think one of the unfortunate side effects is, is that you're seeing someone like you, you, we're seeing each other, you know, from the chest up, mm -hmm. uh, it makes it even harder. I think, I think there's a lot of inertia in therapists. We've taught a certain way. We're you know, we sit in the chair, clients sit in the, in, the, in the chair, unless we're trained in psychodrama or some movement therapy or some somatic forms of therapy, we tend to sit in our chair and talk, you know, more head to head. Uh, and I think the more we can activate different parts of ourselves, our body, our heart, our breathing, our, our, our you know, again, our, our feelings, our thoughts, our fantasies, our whole the essence of our whole being, I think, makes for a more vibrant and alive therapy that you know in my <laughs> subjective opinion yeah. uh, is yeah. a good thing yeah, uh, but but as you say it's the... harder it's harder to do i mean i you know i try with zoom i see a few clients uh uh you know and i'll try and you know if i see them tense up you know have them exaggerate some movements but you know yeah. getting them to stand up and walk around and do things it's it's i think more challenging and easier to forget about doing that mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly it is. Um, I think probably we have a little bit of a um, um, a biased perception about how much somatic elements are in therapy because we because we seek out people who are into somatic therapy and we talk to them and so and so maybe our perception is that it is uh, you know it's more common than it actually is uh, and you know i can appreciate you you probably have a, a broader perspective of what therapists are doing out there because you're not necessarily seeking out these people that are including the whole body so um but, but yeah, it's very true look at what's being taught in the graduate programs it's a well lot that's of, that's right and, what, yeah. and, and uh you know and and, uh, and again going back to our conversation with louis cosolino who's who's there teaching um you know these these kids coming up um through the university programs and um and he said you know basically they said you just 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 give us the formula so that and and a, a talking head formula so we can just go out and and execute it and fix people which yeah <laughs> not a good attitude it, it, it was interesting at the one of the the ericsson conferences pat ogden did a, a wonderful presentation and she showed some uh some uh, uh videotape of 
work she did. And there were there were a few uh, situations where she came into contact with the client. It was all done in my mind beautifully, permissively, and uh, you know, even and, the way you and, say that she came into contact. Like that's right. Know. I, you mean she touched the client? It's right. a radical it's a, thing to do. That's yeah. right. So I said I said it with that caution, which has been imposed upon uh, upon therapists. That's right. That's right. And anyway, so she did, and I just looked and I thought, oh, that was beautiful. And the client, you know, obviously benefited a great deal. And uh, and and I went up to the uh, the bathroom following that, and and it's it's actually quite unusual for men to talk to each other in the bathroom I, I, my wife tells right. me that that the the females uh, bathroom is quite a chat place but anyway so these men were talking in 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 the bathroom and i thought wow this is important and so i chimed in and uh, and he said oh i could never do that you know I, i'd be sued uh, yeah and they were they were uh and it's not so much that they're right or wrong but what it is is that they were constrained by established uh, rules and regulations uh, that were set externally. Again, this external thing, and the um, uh, and I'm thinking, but what about the client? What if what if it really helps the client, like we saw in that that expose? So this thing of of client based um, processing of client oriented, as different from the client's diagnosis oriented or the client's um, uh, determined what we determine they're, they're, they're presenting. And the, um, the therapies that we, that we teach and we have on our, you know, on our various websites teaching do tend to have an orientation towards, towards some kind of, of, of disposition that we believe the client, the client has. And I'm just wondering if that's something that is very, very difficult to shake the, the, the need for the therapist to have some kind of decisive uh, either diagnosis if they're approved for that or just some kind of opinion and how much that helps. There, my mind goes off in a lot of directions as I listen uh, to that. One thing I think of is our, I think our training, it try, you know, it pro professionalizes us. We're, we're trying to learn things, we learn about boundaries. Uh, and even though I think most of the kind of modern or contemporary therapies don't see direct lineage from you know psycho psychoanalysis to what they're doing, mm -hmm. I think one one of the underlying lineages that, that comes through is is this idea of the blank slate, not in those language, not in those terms. But I think I think it's just filtered over the years. This idea that therapists need to be neutral; they need to have mm -hmm. boundary. They, they need to not share too much about themselves. They need to t turn around the question. You know, where are you going on vacation? Well, what, you know, this you know classic therapy line of well, what 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 are your thoughts or what are your what, what do you feel about that? Yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and I, I I do think that's that has been kind of passed along and mm -hmm. uh, again you know my father is quite an outspoken advocate of, of self you know judicious self disclosure mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, not too judicious I mean he, he, he'd say kind of on the side of just being honest and being frank is obviously uh, the goal is to, is always to what's going to be helpful to the client so not just you know but if a client asks you a question you know you know answer it and then be attuned to well, maybe why they're asking it or what reaction they might have or, you know, so, but uh, the the blank slate was never, in my opinion, a blank or neutral slate. It was, it's not a neutral thing to do in, in, in normal human intercourse is yeah. to be neutral and withholding. It's not a blank slate. It's a cold withholding, you know. Uh, awkward, unnatural slate. Exactly, so, it's not a human. It's not a human state. I mean, right. I, I was I was educated that you you do not self disclose and you do not touch the client. Self disclosing yeah. is robbing the client, right, of the of their valuable time with you, and touching them is akin to assault, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> so, yeah, um, pretty pretty scary way to start. <laughs> so, so just to com to complete my thought, I I think that's one of the things that. Uh, is kind of comes along with this professionalization that is unfortunate 
And yeah, uh, you know, client, new therapist, even more experienced. We're, we're anxious. It's, it's an ambiguous enterprise. You know, mm. if you're an accountant or you're, you know, a lawyer, there are other things to be anxious about, but you kind of know what, what you're supposed to do. I mean, what are we supposed to do? You know, really, clients are telling us about their life and what are we supposed to do? And uh, if we do that, is that right? I mean, there, there is, it's a creative enterprise. What does that mean to connect with the person or establish a rapport? How do you do that? Do you, do you stay on content? Do you, do you, you know, ask them to tune into their emotions? Do you smile and kind of tell a story or a fantasy you had as they were talking? I mean, all of these things may or may not advance the relationship. And that's, that's certainly part of the art uh, of therapy. But I, I think for me, one of the goals uh, over the course of your career and development of as a therapist, uh, if you're doing things right, I think is you become more of yourself. You find a way to bring yourself into your work in a way that feels natural and congruent in a way that may not, when you're first learning, learning and, you, and you, you're preoccupied, well, what should I say? Or, you know, how should I be? Or is it okay to self-disclose or not? Yes, it's a, I mean, yeah. that, that wonderful word that just came in there is a, a natural part of, uh, uh, of the language. What am I supposed to do? supposed mm -hmm. to do so so who who determines the supposed and of course when you first come out um you've been told what you're supposed to do is these evidence-based practices and you find one you specialize in the way you go or you might go work for an agency that um that sells themselves or, or promotes themselves on the basis of certain specific uh, treatment types and i i know i see uh, occupations or um, job op uh, applications where they say, and we need someone who is who is expert in blah blah blah. So this type of framing goes on all the time. But then, as you say, and I, I can't agree with you more. Over time, we find that what we're supposed to do is be ourselves. Yes. Um, but <clears throat> who is ourselves as a therapist <laughs> un until yeah. we have gone through the experiences and learned? Yeah, we're going to have yeah. to start a whole new podcast mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because well, I mean, who that's we, the most valuable. Who, who thing. are we? Yeah, yeah exactly. Who, who are we? Uh, I'm from space. Grad yeah. school's not going to teach you that, is it? I mean, it's you know, we're, we're not being. We, we are actually being taught to be technicians to execute the set formula, mm -hmm. and yet, as you said, um, Victor, the most valuable thing is discovering who you are and and be able to be yourself, and you just. That doesn't come with the certificate after three or four years of study. I mean, I, I, I from what I hear, you know, I, I'm not in the classroom. Uh, I, you know, interact with a fair amount of therapists through psychotherapy.net, but I, I think there are those valid critiques that you know you make that Lou, Lou Casalino makes that I make. Uh, but then again, I know, you know, I know that many professors teaching these institutions, and I know what they're like. And I know that they're they're thoughtful and human and caring and concerned about the inner development of therapists. So I I don't think it's that black black or white that all students no. are being is is technique. But I, I I think there's an over emphasis on that from my reading of the situation. Uh, well, I know <clears throat> just in doing the the technique. Uh, that uh, or, or the approach that Ernie Rossi and I do is called the mirroring hands, and I'll I'll do a workshop, and I will teach them how to do it, uh, and I'll teach them technique, and I'll teach that, and the uh, getting it's quite easy for someone to get the impression that that's the way you do it, and I keep having to say uh, as I go along, and I try now to say it quite regularly, you know, every hour or so, I say, and remember, I hardly ever do it this way in. In the, in the actual process. I find it much more emergent, much more improvisational, much more spontaneous. And then I'll go on and teach, but this is how you do it. And the way, uh, uh, you know, Matt and I talked about it a lot and the may, way we eventually came down and I, I found a marvelous uh, um, a piece written uh, uh, about Chick Corea, the jazz pianist. And he was asked by a uh, a, a young lad, uh, you know, I, I want to be a great improviser like you, Chick, you know. And <laughs> he, he said, 
okay, you want to improvise? You want to know how to be spontaneous and just produce these extraordinary uh, notes that no one's ever thought of before? Go learn technique. So go learn the scales. Go learn how to play the classics. Go learn how to do it perfectly. And when you get the technique right, then forget it and just play. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a great comment, but also quite a challenge, I think, to the, uh, to the mm. upcoming student. Uh, you know, I worked with Ernie for 15 years, and I would say I didn't really know what I was doing until about 10 years in. Um, and I would had direct access to the master. So it was, it was, it was uh, you know, I was, I was fortunate. It's interesting. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Th th there's something about learning the rules so then you can go break them and be more creative. Yeah, and I think there's, I mean, I think that's an analogy often, or I think of in terms of jazz, uh, you know, to therapy, you have to, you have to learn the scales. It's not always clear in, in therapy what the scales are, and and mm -hmm. and in jazz, it's not going to be like you know, while you're while you're learning the scales and practicing them, and, and even even uh, you know, most master musicians. Are, or practicing the scales, fit, you know, when That's they're right. in their 90s. Yeah, there's plenty you can do along the way. It's not That's like right. you yeah. do one and, and you, do the, you mm. do the other, but you do have to, you know, you have to learn things. You study with people, you learn theories, you have people hopefully look at your work. Uh, and as you do that, you gain more confidence, which, uh, you know, if in an ideal situation, and you, if you have the support and maybe the, just the predilection to to be more creative in your work then you gradually uh, start to allow yourself to uh, be you know more human more creative more mm -hmm. ex you know doing experiments in your work and see, seeing what works and uh, not feeling so uh, rigid and contained I, I know for me you know I certainly feel a lot freer uh, in my work and more confident doesn't mean I don't have doubts all the time. I think it's, it's um, such an ambiguous work that uh, it's bound to create uh, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now it's easy to, um, to be isolated in this work too, or, you know, we're often working alone. So um, what's your experience of peer to peer engagement, supervision, that sort of thing? How important is it? What should we be doing? Should we be doing more of that in, in your, your um, opinion? Absolutely. When I look back on, you know, I was in private practice. That was, the, you know, full or half time or more for, you know, 20 plus years. And when I look back and think, you know, what would I, I have done differently? Uh, I think that's one of the main things was to find a way to be less isolated. It, it, it was too isolating for me. I, I mean, I was aware of that at the time, but certainly in retrospect, I did have a, a small group of three or four colleagues. We shared office space. And uh, uh, even just having occasionally running into someone in the, in the little kitchenette, that really made my day. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, you know, and earlier in my practice, I had my own office and just to be there, and not see anyone you knew other than your clients all day long. That, that was really not a good setup. Um, but absolutely, I think uh, that's one of the greatest, if not the greatest pitfall of our profession is, is isolation. Um, you're having very intimate contact with your clients, uh, but it's, it's even if you're more self-revealing and more transparent, it's still a... a somewhat one-sided relationship it's certainly it's a different type of you know the, the relationship there even though you may get some benefits and some satisfaction and and just that uh, of your work you're there to help the client that yeah your yeah. Your, your social your social uh you know uh quota is not is not not the purpose there so whether it's certainly consultation groups and now it's now that therapists have suddenly realized they can do things online, mm -hmm. and I ran some consultation groups for a while, and, and it was hard to get people and get people to be there at the same place at the same time. And I just started, I had someone reach out one consultation, and I 
I said, well, if you if you can form find some other colleagues and form a group, I'd be I'd love to do it. We just started doing that, and and so uh, you know whether it's uh, led by someone who has some expertise or or whether it's a peer consultation group, I would really I think every therapist should be yeah doing that. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah. So because I I mean I heard your father speak about this a number of times. Uh, over the years and and seen a number of uh, video sessions which was which was terrific and uh, that that and he would have these the these groups for quite some period uh, lengths of time uh, and I know myself I, I've I've got a sort of a core group of of professionals who come under sort of under me as, as supervisees but really there's there's a lot of equality in it but uh, I suppose with one I was looking I said wow you've been doing this for three years now uh, and you know, no. I said, "Are you getting bored with me? You, you, do you want to go see something else?" And everybody said, "No, no, no. It's great. I love, I love the interaction. There's always something new because I've just talked to someone like Victor Yalom, or I've just, you know, so I'm always telling them the new stories." But, um, uh, but uh, Irving was quite a quite an advocate for for this 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 integration and interaction. Um, and I think this was very, very powerful in what I remember from his teachings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, of course, he used to be proponent and teacher of group therapy. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, I think you, you also want to, I think certainly early in your career, you want to have more, you want to have a lot of professional contact because you're really in that learning phase. Hopefully you're always in that learning phase. We, we mm. We came up with the tagline for psychotherapy.net, great therapists never stop learning, which yeah. uh, is a good one. I like it. Um, but certainly, you know, in your early career, you, you want more input and, and guidance and supervision or consultation. Uh, and then I think it's also tuning into what you need socially, you know, what, what feels right to you. If, you. if you have a rich, you know, family life, if you have a rich social life, uh, outside of your work, you may feel, you know, less need uh, for that. If you don't, uh, you know, a lot of people get a lot of their uh, social life through their workplace. And, yeah. you know, if you work at an agency or a place where you have colleagues, you may get that. If you work mm. in private practice, probably you don't. And I think it's uh, important to design a life, a life balancing. And people always talk about that, but really what is, what works for you? You know, I think, or, you, you know, some people are just born therapists. They love it. They can work 40, see 40 clients a week and they're energized from it. I was not that kind of person. Uh, some people, you know, a lot of people work less than full time and either, you know, have some other income or just, you know, figure out, figure it out. But I think it's, it's, um, you know, I've always felt it's strange. It's a strange profession that we're in. Uh, I mean, it's 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 a noble and a beautiful profession, but it's a strange that we're sitting in our office for you know however many hours a week, and people are coming and we're talking to them and we're trying to help them and yeah. uh, you know it. Uh, but you know, in an ideal world, I've always had this kind of ideal vision, which I'm, I guess I'm kind of living now in a way of that a therapist would be someone with some life experience, they've some, some education, some training, uh, but they've been out in the world, they've done some different things. And then they, uh, you know, devote a certain number of hours a week to trying to help other people, you know, or like yeah. you had a wise man in your community. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think if I were, you know, seeking a therapist at this point, you know, you'd want that's those are the qualities I'd want someone who's done other things in their life other than just sit and talk to people. Uh, yeah. They, um, but the, the reality of the world is in economics, you go, you know, you grow up, you decide, you go to school, you you're drawn to the field, and then you got to make a living. And for yeah. most people, that involves that's a full time job or that's a full practice. And uh, then then you try to, how can I tweak it? Do I get exercise? Uh, for me, I found, you know, one of the things I really struggled with was getting sleepy until I had an aha moment that I can't see clients after lunch. And I right. religiously <laughs> never book clients at two o'clock and I would take, take a 20 minute nap and that, you know, so everyone is different in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I certainly appreciated being in a, 
a bigger practice. We have about a dozen different therapists and the tea room was always a buzz with talk about, you know, um, cases and, and techniques and all sorts of things and just gleaning so much wisdom from the older ones that have been doing this for many, many years. And certainly knowing, noticing the difference then when I went to my own uh, office space away from everybody and not having that interaction. Um, and I oh. think, you know, we, we, we need to try and recreate the tea room. <laughs> in- That's a, that sounds really wonderful. What you just said at the, the last bit there was pretty nice, but, you know, really just a, an, yeah. a, a beautiful definition of a, of a therapist, which is really the sort, of, the sort of guy that would emerge in the village. Uh, yeah, I used yeah. to talk about this. That it, it'd be Auntie Mary and Uncle Bob, you know, and, and people would turn up with a cake or a, a you know their tool belt on and 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 fix the roof, and uh, and and therapy would be a an emergent experience. Which uh, yeah, no, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to minimize that. Those, if there were such people in the world that uh, were wise and real selfless, um, you know that it's wonderful that people like that in your life, but they wouldn't necessarily have the skills that therapists have. They might have, no, it's different. Yeah. They might have, they might may, they might be natural therapists who, if they decided to become therapists would be, would be uh, very gifted. You know, I think Carl Rogers uh, was reportedly said, uh, you know, therapy should be chosen, not, not trained mm. or something like that. Uh, but if you had those people, and then gave them the training of therapists. Certainly the training of therapists, you know, has a lot to offer. We, we, we do know something. Uh, um, again, yeah. I quote my mentor, Jim Bugentall, he, he, he would say something to the effect, you know, clients want us to be experts, you know, and the wish that we had, could give them the answers. And we're not, we're not experts on the client's lives. We're not, we're not experts, experts on them. Yeah, we're not experts on how they should live their eye, live their lives, or what decisions they should make, or you know, what they should do about their depression. Or, but we are experts. We do have expertise. We are experts yeah. in the process of helping people. Of psycho, which was what yeah. psychotherapy. We do have tools and techniques and attitudes that, uh, hopefully. If you're any good at it, you know, help the majority of the people you work with in a way that's different from, you know, Uncle Harry or whoever. That's right. Well, that was the village a couple of hundred years ago before, you know, (laughs) yeah. But, the, but well, let's, I mean, as in a wrap up uh, as we go, let's just have a a, a little final uh, sort of discussion or quick mention about what's going on at psychotherapy. Net. I know uh, I saw just today there's a, a new program on uh, you know ACT uh, act therapy which is which is terrific and so uh, you know what what's uh, what's the sort of thing that people should uh, pop in and be having a look at uh, right now yeah well so I started this 27 years ago with this one video of a teacher of mine and over the years you know back then there wasn't a lot available there were uh, there, uh, there were some videos, and most of them were single session here. And they got a camera, they filmed a session of therapy. And compared to what there was prior to that, you know, this was a fantastic improvement. We are one of the, you know, strangest professions, and then our training traditionally has been such that we may graduate and never have seen someone do therapy. Now it's not like mm-hmm. that anymore, but, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. still compared to any other profession, whether you're a plumber or a dancer, or an attorney, a bulk of your training and apprenticeship, you're watching your boss or other, your colleagues work. They're watching you. It, it's, you know, that's just kind of the way, a natural way it should be. It would seem. And the therapy is generally uh, devoid of that or limited of that. Uh, so we started just filming uh, therapists working, adding discussion, adding commentary, and also finding videos that were out in the world that, you know, before, it, you know, the internet was just starting that no one knew about and tracking them down and finding a video of Carl Rogers that was sitting in vault in, in the Royal Radio Television of Ireland uh, vaults and uh, yeah. putting that out. So um, we have gone from you know, single sessions to recording multiple sessions with clients, uh, times editing those down. We, we did a series on emotionally focused couples therapy that 
we ended up filming over 100 hours of wow. uh, EFT sessions. Uh, one client was there for a year and a half, and one couple. And my my wife, uh, <laughs> thankfully, uh, is a more patient. I she, she's not a therapist, but she she worked with the expert Rebecca Jorgensen to edit those down to oh, 10 hours, and then added commentary. So we're trying to go to I think from. You know, therapy videos 1.0 to 2.0, where we're rather than just showing whole sessions, we're filming multiple sessions with multiple clients and trying, uh, when we can, break it down into some. Here are some skills you can learn. Here, you know, uh, here are specific techniques. Here's maybe what not to do. Uh, so really, uh, develop them into, you know. Uh, videos, you know, that are going to be useful for people. And then having some shorter videos because people, we, as you know, we have a dramatically shrinking attention span. I'm sure if you look at the, the stats on your podcast, how many people are actually listening to yeah. us, you know, one hour in, uh, you know, thank you. If you are, thank you very much. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. And I guess the final thing I'm, I'm involved in now is uh, over these years, I generally, uh, been the interviewer and I brought experts on and then I had discussions with them about their work and after at the age of 62 uh, something is something some light bulb has gone on that thinks well maybe I have a few things I can teach myself so I've been in the process of uh, recording uh, sessions that I'm doing and uh, put out uh, one so far and in the process of uh, collecting footage and looking through that and we'll be hopefully in the next year or so releasing uh, uh, videos or an entire course uh, uh, with myself and, and some other colleagues demonstrating some of the things that uh, uh, we've been talking about today. So that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. Oh, it sounds terrific. Brilliant. So, so Matt, I think uh, I think we'll, but we'll have to finish up for the day because of that very thing of everybody dropping off. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, um, Victor Yulom, it was so great um, meeting you and having this chat. And uh, we do encourage everyone to jump across to psychotherapy.net and check out everything that you have there. But thank okay. you so much for today. Well, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a. I don't know if I had any original thoughts, but you certainly. Push, push this conversation in lots of directions. So uh, we, we, we covered a lot of interesting ground and uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, the spontane spontaneity of it. Um, yeah, me too, me too. Thank you. Thanks so much, Victor. See you soon.